cuando queráis. Okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Carlos Granel, the president of the Spanish National Committee of Large Dams. And I, I, I want to welcome everybody to this international webinar uh, about uh, modeling and digitalization on dams. This webinar, as, as you may know, is co-organized by, by the Young Professionals Forum of ICOL and also the European Club of, of, of ICOL and, and the Spanish National Committee of Large Dams. Here with us, you can see to, um, uh, to Mateja Klum, the president of the Young Professional Forum of ICOL and also uh, Alfredo Granados, the uh, secretary general of the European Club of, of ICOL. Uh, as you may know also, this event coincides with the celebration of the World Dam Date initiative of the European Club of ICOL and about what my colleague Alfredo will speak after. Okay, The purpose of the event is to show the recent experience about digitalization and, model, uh, and modeling uh, to dam management and, and numerical modeling. Okay. And without further, I want to introduce Mateja Klum, president of the Young Professional Forum, who will introduce the speakers and the presentation. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. So my name is Mateja Klum, and today I will be moderating the sessions. And let me start first by explaining some housekeeping rules. So as you can see, you are currently all muted and you will stay muted during the presentation. But if you have any questions during the presentation, you can write them in chat. Uh, at the end of all the presentations, we will have a 30 minute uh, discussion session where your questions will be answered. Also, if you want to ask a question during the Q&A session, you can ask moderator and he'll give you the permission to speak. Now, uh, each of the technical presentations are 30 minutes long. And I will start right away by presenting the first speaker, who is Narhe Sultani. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the UP Valencia, and she has an extensive experience in numerical analysis of large uh, concrete arch dams. For example, she has analyzed into the details the cracking of the Karun for dam in Iran and did some amazing analysis of large dams in Spain. And Arges, I would just like to invite you to Thank you, thank you very much, Mateja. Uh, let me share my presentation. Vale. Uh, thank you, Matia, for uh, the introduction. Uh, today, I want to uh, present a practical framework for dynamic analysis of uh, GAN Foundation um, systems. Uh, the reason uh, for that, it comes from the, the challenge I had during my different projects. For every project, uh, I had to search over tens of books, articles, bulletins, etc. So I decided to put every important part I found uh, together and prepare this practical framework that can be used uh, as an accelerator to the dynamic numerical simulation of that foundation system. First of all, we would have a, a review on some important basic. Then we talk about how we can prepare the dynamic inputs. Then we apply this dynamic input to the numerical model. And in the end, we talk about the interesting subject of damping. 
The first important thing is uh, knowing different types of earthquake magnitude. In the literature, they may report the earthquake by different scale, like the Richter magnitude, shear, uh, surface wave magnitude, body weight. And the most important one that in, in the, as an engineer, we normally use is the moment magnitude. Here in this graph, you can see uh, the relationship between the moment magnitude with the other ones. And you can see that until the magnitude of six, uh, all the scales are almost the same, and after it, it they differ a bit. So if in one of the documents you instead of the moment uh, magnitude you have another one with this graph easily you can convert them together. Uh, the next step is knowing what is the design or analysis level. Normally we have two different level of analysis. First one that is OBE, Operating Basic Earthquake. We say that we are going to design our structure at somehow, uh, at somehow that we have just minor or accessible damage and the whole structure of the dam and all the rest parts, connected parts should remain functional. But on the other side, uh, we have SAE Safety Evaluation Earthquake or MBE Maximum Design Earthquake. These two are exactly the same, just in different literature. They, they have different naming. We say that in this level, okay, we can accept more damage, but still in this level, we shouldn't have any uncontrolled release of water from the reservoir. So then for each return period, we should decide uh, for each level of the analysis that we have here, we should decide about the per return period that of the earthquake. For choosing that, we can have uh, two different approaches, deterministic approach or probabilistic approach. In the deterministic approach, which is the easiest one, we say, I don't consider nothing. I want to design the whole structure for the maximum credible earthquake that can happen at site and I design everything deterministically for that. But in the probabilistic approach, we, have, we also have two different parts. We can have a standard base or risk base. In the standard base, you can use a table like this that easily, this all have references and the references are in the end of the presentation. You can use in the probabilistic standard base, you can use this table that says that, for example, for the level of OBE, an earthquake with the return period of 475 years, or for the SEE, 10,000 uh, year would be a good estimation. But in the risk based analysis, we don't choose a specific a return period, but we consider a range of different return periods for the earthquake. And for each of them, we calculate the conditional probability of the failure that comes from the uncertainties of the material, of the geometry, and etc. And the total probability of the failure can be, can be calculated by multiplication of these two. Then what is a response spectrum? A um, response spectrum is defined for a specific earthquake record. The process of extracting response spectrum for a specific record is shown here. For the different structures that all of them are single degree of freedom and every of them have, all of, every of them have their own mass, stiffness, and damping, uh, the motion equation can be solved for calculating the displacement, the, the velocity, and the acceleration, time histories, and also the period of each structure can be calculated easily by solving this aging value problem. Then, for after having the uh, acceleration time histories, if we just keep the the point with the maximum acceleration and we depict these points against the period, we would have a graph that we call it response spectrum. So we keep this concept for continuing uh, of the uh, process. Uh, another important thing is that in all these structures that we consider, normally it is accepted to consider the damping of all the structure equally to 5%. 
And also uh, this process that uh, I, showed, I showed here can be done with uh, lots of uh, software like a, a, a seismal signal. Uh, the most challenging part is uh, calculating the natural frequency of a dam foundation system, which is a multi degree of freedom structure. For this reason, we have to calculate this a free field motion equation that you can see in the right part of the equation. We have no air squared, and we have no we have we don't have external dynamic loading, which means that the natural frequency of our, of our system is independent of the dynamic load that we want to apply to our model. This equation can be uh, simplified to this equation that you can see in this equation, we don't have any damping. So it means that the natural frequency of the system is also independent of the damping parameter. But now the challenge comes here. For a damp foundation structure, uh, this matrix of stiffness and mass how then we can how we want to calculate this? This is not like a building with the concentrated mass that we can calculate it easily. In some software like the Abacus, there is a button that you can choose and it will calculate you natural frequency automatically. But in some other software like Itasca software, you don't have that option. So at somehow you should examine how much is the natural frequency of your structure. The here. Um, we want to show you how in any numerical software with the concept of resonance, you can examine the first mode natural frequency of the system. For this reason, uh, we need to first build a numerical model of the foundation system with all the static loads and all the band static boundary conditions and ensure that our structure is, new, is uh, statically in equilibrium. Then we change the uh, static boundary condition to the dynamic one. Also, we change the static uh, the parameters, uh, atomic parameters, material parameters to the dynamic one. Then we want to apply different simple harmonic uh, dynamic loads, which with different frequencies, to the bottom of our model. Here you can see that I chose a different same uh, function, each one with the same, like, which all of them have the same amplitude, but with the different frequencies. We apply one by one this uh, load to the dam, to the, to the below the model, and we watch to see in which of these loads we have more response, more answer. So that load probably is the load uh, that has the frequency close to the natural first natural frequency of our model. Here you can see the example of a dam that in, the, in this point, point of the middle, we have the stress concentration. So I chose this point as a representative point. And if for this point, we draw the power spectrum of velocity of this point, you can see that when I uh, apply the, the load with one and a half for a hertz frequency, I have more response. So probably the the first mode natural frequency of existence of this system is more close to one and a half hertz. Then now we want to step by step prepare uh, the dynamic inputs. First of all, we need for each return period know that uh, what is the design response spectrum. Before we talked about the response spectrum, this is design response spectrum. That is a bit more complicated and needs a specialist for uh, extracting that. Normally this uh, design response spectrum that from now on uh, we call it just simply a DRS. DRS can be extracted from the national laws normally or in the case of uh, dam structures that are the infra structures, usually a specific hazard investigation is done at the dam site and they report you directly how much and how is the design response spectrum. Also, 
with every design response spectrum, they tell you, they report to you that this DRS is related to a branch of earthquake that have a specific characteristic. This characteristic can be accelerogram, magnitude, epicentral, uh, distance, hypocentral depth, soil shear wave velocity, and etc. So now our objective is to find earthquakes that are uh, similar uh, to, that have char characteristics similar to our design response spectrum. And FEMA uh, 65 uh, says that the, for each return period, the atollists need three different records of the earthquake. For finding the earthquake that have the same characteristics as the design response spectrum, we can use the online library of PEER, which is a very useful tool that you hear you can add your characteristic and you can download every uh, lots of different earthquake that you need. Here, uh, in this step, we download lots of different records. Then later, we choose just three best one and delete the rest. I also here uh, prepared a list of famous earthquakes that mainly are uh, referenced in the literature. You can see here the characteristic. So if your record period has characteristic close to this earthquake, as they are so important in the literature, uh, I recommend you firmly that include this record also to your analysis. So, now we downloaded lots of different earthquakes and we want to do uh, the scaling process to uh, match the, this uh, earthquake to, to the design response spectrum that we have. The process is shown here. First of all, for each record, we extract the response spectrum of the acceleration by the same process I explained you in the basics. And then with having this, and also the design response spectrum, we fill this table that we have different periods. For each period, we have response spectrum, we have design response spectrum. Then we calculate the ratio of DRS to RS. Then for the range of 0.2 to two times of the first mod period of the structure, we can calculate the mean of the ratios. This mean of the ratios is the scale we need for doing the um, scaling. Also, we can calculate the mean square error that is important for choosing which earthquake is better than the other one. So with this scale factor, we do the scaling. We do the scaling of response spectrum. Now that we see it is fine, I will like it. Then we convert back the response spectrum again to the acceleration time history and, the, and we keep this. <clears throat> All this process I explained you also can be done automatically by the peer online website. You can just choose the scaling method and you up, you can upload your design response spectrum and it, can, and it gives you all the earthquakes that you need with the scale factor and the error. So then from here, if you sort the error, you can choose the three um, records that have the least error and choose them as the best one that have more match uh, to your design response spectrum. Another important thing is that if you are doing a, a three-dimensional analysis, you need both horizontal direction of the record. So we recommend you that, uh, first of all, resist with the SRSS calculation, you can combine these two horizontal record to one record and then scale this record and then use the same scaling factor for each of them separately. Also, if you have you want, you have to apply the vertical component components also to your model, and if there is no special hazard study for the vertical component, you can also use the same scale factor of the horizontal scale factor for also the vertical component. But as 
exactly so uh, in this scaling simple scaling method we can choose our uh, desired record but the thing is that as you can see that sometimes uh, this simple way of scaling cannot give us a beautiful match as you can see here we, we don't have any acceptable match so we recommend you after doing the primary scaling and choosing your three best records you finish the scaling, but also another advanced scaling method. Here we propose you the Abrahamson method that you can see here. This uh, green nuts are the scaled by the Abrahamson method, and the red one is the design response spectrum that you can see we have a perfect match here. So first doing a primary scaling choosing our three best one based on the error and then complement it with the advanced method of the Abrahamson. This method of the Abrahamson is supported by some software like uh, Seismo Match. Then now we scale our record we may need to do some uh, modification on our record. The modification that we may need are the convolution analysis, baseline correction, and filter. What is the, the convolution analysis? That as we know, the records that we downloaded are the motion registered by the accelerator graph, which uh, normally uh, is installed on the bedrock close to the earthquake site close to the earthquake zone. Then with scaling, we move this motion to the to the site of the our, our project, to the site of the dam. Now then we have a numerical model that we are choosing a, a, a zone of the area, a, a zone for doing the numerical analysis. And then we want to apply the load, the dynamic load to the bottom of the model. But the thing is that this scaled record that is for the surface record that is at the place of our dam, if we put the same records to the below the foundation, this wave, um, while is coming up to the dam site, it uh, propagates and uh, increases, and when it comes up, it's not. It, it is not at all the same desired record that, that we wanted. This happens when you are adding. For, this happens when you have two situations. One of them, you are putting the earthquake below your foundation. And second of all, you are simulating your foundation with mass. If you have this situation, you cannot put exactly, you cannot put the same scaled record below your foundation. You should do the the convolution analysis that says that which record, which motion should I put below the dam, below the foundation to be sure when it comes up and reach to the dam part, dam location, it is my desired scale motion. What is the uh, baseline correction? A baseline correction comes from an uh, error that happens during the scaling. When we do the scaling on the records, we change uh, the, the parameters, the characteristic of the earthquake a, a bit. One of the things that changes, we change also the history of the velocity and we change the um, area below the velocity that is, um, that is the displacement. So sometimes with, during the scaling, we see that the last point of the displacement of the record is not zero. It means that we have a, the earthquake is done, but it still is like we have a residual displacement in our model. For making this displacement against zero, we can use the baseline collection, correction that in, in this method, they come and add a low frequency velocity wave to the, to the first velocity in a somehow that they show that the final displacement is zero and what is filtering uh, you know that when we are doing the numerical uh, simulation we have to do a uh, mesh in our model but the largest allowable size of the mesh that we can have in our model for uh, for doing a, a dynamic analysis can be calculated by this formula 
that F is the maximum frequency of the uh, records. So it has, if you are applying a record of the R squared to our model that has lots of high frequency, um, high frequencies, it may end to extremely fine mesh required. But sometimes these high uh, frequencies that you can see here, they don't affect much your results. So you can easily cut them and remove them from the model. You can have a you, you can have bigger mesh and uh, everything would be better. So this process of cutting uh, high frequencies of the record is called field time. Here, uh, we want to uh, present you the software of eData that uh, we uh, developed in the ePRESAS risk analysis company. Uh, eData is a short of the ePRESAS deconvolution analysis of target acceleration. With this software that we developed in ePRESAS, you can easily do uh, the deconvolution analysis, the baseline correction, and also the filtering. The part of the code of the deconvolution analysis in this software is based on the famous code of uh, Shake 91, which is a code um, developed by the Berkeley University. Here you can see the first uh, window of the software. You can define the column of different material in your model, define the If, uh, and you also need to define your uh, target acceleration uh, with all the material you need. And also you need to define uh, these two curves uh, which are changing the uh, damping and the shear modulus against the uh, strain. With putting all this, you can here tick the baseline correction and also filtering at the, any cutoff that you like and it gives you all the results of the deconvolution filtering and baseline correction. It's a very simple and useful and special, special uh, interface for doing these jobs. Now we have, we have our records, we scaled it, we modified it, and they are now ready for applying to our numerical model. Uh, but uh, the important thing is that when you have the viscose boundary condition, never ever apply a history of the velocity or history of the acceleration to the same uh, boundary that you have viscose condition. Because viscose condition and the velocity and acceleration, they are, work, they are from the same family. So if you add one of them, the another one automatically would be removed when it's from your mother. So if you are working with a software that forces you to just work with the velocity and acceleration, like ITASCA softwares, you have to transfer the velocity to, with this simple formula to the asterisk, and then a, a, instead of applying the time history of the velocity, you can apply the time history of the asterisk to the bottom of your model. And the last part of the, the last part, but not the least part is uh, about the damping. As we know, we have two famous type of damping. We have Riley damping and we have hysteric damping. Uh, Riley damping, as we know, we can use it for elastic structures or in the structures that, that the level of the plasticity is low. In this model, the damping would be uh, defined by two parts of the mass proportional damping and also the uh, stiffness proportional damping. But on the other side, hysteric damping is used for the model that we have considerable plastic flow like this and the one that happened in embankment. The most important thing is that never, never, ever use full definition of Riley damping and hysteric damping at the same time to your model, which is too much for the model. For the Riley damping, we may need to define these two coefficients of alpha and beta to our model. 
uh, and this alpha and beta can be calculated by these two different formulation formulas. Uh, in the first one, we need two frequencies of the two modes of the motion of our structure that these two frequencies can be calculated by the same strategy of resonance that we were talking before. The first most answer can be the first mode and the second one can be the second mode. Also, we need the critical damping ratio that for the concrete dam, we, normally it is accepted to consider is 5%. Other side in the in this formula we need the first mode natural frequency that we talk about is it and then we need the minimum critical damping ratio that the, if you do the deconvolution analysis by the edata software one of the results that uh, in the end gives you is also the damping parameters this minimum critical damping for every layers of your model separately. And then for the historic damping, we need to define this curve to our model, which, which is the change of the degradation of the shear modulus against the strain. Most important things. Never think that this is supplement to any nonlinear model of your material. This is just a curve for historic damping. And the definition of the nonlinearity of your material behavior should be done separately in the other section, uh, other part of the definition. Uh, the, another important thing that happens even you are using the history damping is that here in the first of the analysis, in the first of the graph, you can see we have a horizontal line, which means that when the level of the strain is low, you don't have any degradation in your stiffness. It means that you are applying no history damp, no damping to your model. So for the beginning of the model, it is recommended that you can use a, a small amount of uh, Riley damping can be 0.2 percentage, but applying this amount of Riley damping just proportional to the stiffness part because the, in the first of beginning of the analysis, the stiffness is maximum, Riley damping would work. And when the strain increase, the, the stiffness decrease, and this part of the Riley that is just proportional to the stiffness would be removed automatically. And in the other side, historic damping would work. So in this way, you are sure that these two dampings are not working at the same time together, but they are completing each other. Here I have some important references. Thank you everybody for listening me. Thank you Matea and also the Spine Call for giving me this opportunity. I want also uh, thank uh, especially for my to my supervisor, Professor Ignacio Escudero Bueno. Uh, which uh, which have been supporting me all all the time, and I learned him learn lots from him. I also want to thank my former supervisor, Professor Mohammed Ali Ahmadi, which was uh, which have been uh, my supervisor for long for more than seven years for my master and my PhD. I think he's also connected today here, and he is with us. I want to tell him thank you for all the lessons you gave me. And now I am using line by line of the every note you gave me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Narhes, for your very structurized presentation <laughs> and step-by-step -step explanation on how to perform numeric simulations of large concrete dams. Uh, for now, I will ask you if you can stay here until the Q&A sessions. I bet there will be questions directed to you. And for us, let's continue. The next, pre next presentation is then monitoring and surveillance at Itaipu Dam, which will be presented by Ore Furtal de Faria, PhD, uh, who is a senior engineer at Itaipu Hydroelectric Plant in the areas of dam safety 
and at Concrete and Materials Laboratory. He's also a member of the Brazilian National Committee on them. So hello to Brasilia. <laughs> Good morning. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and also a member of our ILM Isle called Dan Atzo. He has uh, more than 20 years of experience in the field. And please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can see your screen. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to participate uh, of this webinar. And thank you very much. I will show you some some aspects of uh, monitoring and some surveillance, some surveillance in, at the table dam. <clears throat> uh, we have only 30 minutes, so we have lots of work uh, that I could not show you today. Yeah, you know? but uh, I'm uh, here to to show you if you want more uh, information. Um, sorry, Itaipu Dam is a large dam, and we have almost eight kilometers length. Uh, these are the parts of the the dam. So, from the the right to the left, we have an earth dam, the spillway, uh, a buttress dam we call right wing dam, and we have uh, six blocks of buttress dam and the right connection blocks. And after the main dam is a hollow gravity dam, and we have hollow and the joint and the core of the, the block. After we have the diversion structure is a, a gravity dam. And after the connection, the right connection, the left, sorry, left connection blocks uh, of buttress dams, of buttress, uh, that, uh, is a buttress dam. And then we have the rock field dam and finally, the the earth dam of the the left part, left stretch. Uh, our beliefs are uh, relies on uh, uh, three points, and uh, that uh, we don't have absolutely safety uh, conditions. This does not exist. Uh, is we have a feeling of uh, depends on who is uh, feeling the safety uh, we don't have and we, we we don't have and we must not do it alone so uh, to avoid decisions uh, by only one person only one technician or uh, only one engineer or technician and there's no coincidence. Uh, so the, instru the instrumentation in Itaipu, uh, we have uh, some key blocks. These black ones are key blocks, fully instrumentation, uh, fl fully instrumented. Uh, we have blocks blocks with few instruments and and blocks without instruments. Uh, the the key blocks have has uh, have a, a full of uh, instruments, several instruments. We, we can see the the list in the 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 right part of the the screen. And the main block, this one is the main block of the dam, the highest one. We have uh, on the the foundation, a uh, shear key, because of a feature, a, a geological feature, is the joint A <clears throat> to to block the displacement between layers of the the compacted rock. Okay. The instruments the, uh, for the instrument uh, by the instrumentation, we have nowadays over. The six million measurements in 40 years of monitoring the, the, the dam. 
uh, the registered uh, readings are allowed to to any of uh, kind of uh, of uh, analysis and uh, numerical and uh, of uh, uh, numerical and uh, and uh, engineering analysis. Uh, nowadays, we have uh, eight thousand more than eight thousand instruments in installed in the dam. Uh, we, uh, from this, uh, we have uh, fifty five hundred drains. Uh, Forty five hundred are of a foundation, and a hundred in the concrete. Uh, some on the the head of the blocks and some on the some on the joints uh the the equipments are constantly uh, benchmarking and uh, are in benchmarking and in calibration uh the equipment uh, have the equipment has constant maintenance and we have uh, we we make replacement when we we need when they, they are not uh, working so well uh in 2022 but uh, 2023 was the same uh, we have we had uh 150,000 measurements and uh we had uh, less than 0.75% of we call revision field, field revision. Uh, that is when the technician needs to go back to the field to, to make a new reading of uh, in the instrument that shows uh, an abnormal reading. And we have two plenty altimetrics campaign by year. Uh, we, now, we are now using the TM60 of uh, Leica to make this this campaigns uh, in the instrument by the instrumentation we measure the formation and overturning now so uh, something like this uh, the, the the formation or the overturning we are using pendulums and in the past we used the coordinometer uh, is a device made by Lenac in Portugal, and nowadays we are using uh, the the micrometer, uh, developed is a system developed by our technicians to measure the the displacement and the, the uh, between uh, 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 between the, the 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 wire and the structure. We use uh, uh, rod extensometers to measure the deformation of foundation, mainly of the, the foundation. So like here we have some, some uh, uh, samples of the, the displacement. And uh, uh, the most part of them are uh, automated by geocon devices. The uplift and drainage uh, is measured by piezometers, and, and water level uh, indicator. <clears throat> so we can analyze the piezometers and, and by this analysis, we, we do a safe for testing the operationality of the piezometers. So we, we can show you a, a result of this, this essay, of one essay we, we made. We are using uh, a sensor. We put it inside the piezometer and we we fill with water, taking care uh, to avoid the the break of uh, of the instrument. Uh, <clears throat> we we have. I said we have uh, uh, fifty five hundred drains. Uh, Okay, we clean it each four years. Uh, the the blocks and uh, uh, we have concrete uh, drains are this the, the, this way uh, uh, in the joints and in the, the head of the block. 
Uh, we are now using the boroscope. <coughs> Sorry. We are now using the boroscope to see uh, inside of the drains and the piezometers. And these pictures show you uh, one of the, the inspection we made by this, this boroscope. And we could, uh, you, we could have some information of in which layer the water is going through to inside to the, the drain. For displacement, we used for almost 40 years the longometer. Uh, the device is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to use because it needs the, 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 the strength of the, the, the technician and it, each technician has a, a different strength to, to put the, the device on the, the pins. So it could give us some differences on the in the, in the the readings, the res, reading results. And nowadays we are using the triorthogonal joint meter. <clears throat> so uh, this device is uh, too much uh, uh, is is not so heavy as the other device. Uh, it, so and the the precision is better than the one and the displacement uh, uh, displacement of the block over the, the the foundation we are using inverted pendulums uh, the geodesy as I said we are using TM sixty for uh campaigns we have eight piles uh outside the dam and some points to measure in the dam <clears throat> and the uh, altimetry the vertical displacement we is measured by this device of Leica also the Leica uh to measure and the data analysis we 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 think in four four points you know, the reliability of the the readings and so the technical staff is ready to make make these measurements so the variability of measurements is is very small uh, almost zero uh we do uh, operationality tests and validating of the measurements using more than one instrument uh, to to compare uh, comparing instrumentations different instruments to to to, gar to guarantee this this operationality after the the readings we make uh, validation so we use old old data for statistical analysis, and then we validate new readings by this this analysis. Uh, we 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 make uh, treatment and analysis of uh, the data by uh, uh, models uh, of, uh, uh, cause and effect. We analyze nowadays the the trends. So we see the uh, we make some visual analysis in the graphs, and then if if it needs, we do the the numerical analysis. And nowadays we are using some statistical tests as KP, SS, and ADF to check the trends of the of the, the historical data, and we are trying. Uh, working on forecasting models to ensure that the the readings uh, are reliable and they do not need any revision in field. We take care of uh, some concerns, so uh, we we could uh, make some 
uh, readings uh, with the technicians at the same time to compare if they if the readings they make are could could uh, could be considered the, the same. So you can see on this this point uh, that when we are uh, registered uh, 14 readings at the same time, so we, we could not see any difference. So uh, any technician has the, the same capacity of reading. And this, this graph shows you the results of uh, uh, the reading of the make, made by the technicians uh, against the against the the automated readings, and we can see they that the the readings are the same, almost the same. Oh. Uh, we take care of uh, of uh, operationality of the instruments, so this is a sample. Uh, when we had uh, the, the one rod extension meter blocked of uh, by 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 powder, uh, the displacement was not correct, and we we saw this one in and we made the maintenance, and the instrument uh, turned to 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 work correctly uh, nowadays we are thinking in in having uh, in have uh, uh, new kinds of limits of alert alerts for the the working of the instruments uh, to to show us when the instrument behaves like this uh, Another concern is about the trends. So um, uh, the the instrument shows the the, the trends by the, a graph, but we need to see the scale of the graph, and to ensure that in forty years we had point uh, five millimeters of trend. So what is this trend? And in terms of the stability of the dam. So we need to take care of this. Uh, about the forecast, and we use, as I said, some, uh, some models uh, using uh, scenes, cosines, and, and for the temperature behavior. And uh, uh, uh another another kinds of causes and to see the effects on on the the measurements of the uh, of the instruments and we can see uh, here we can see that uh when the when the lake when the level of the lake uh went down uh, the instruments uh the, this instrument this piezometer showed the the, the behavior uh, the uh, showing show the behavior by this 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 cause of the uh, this this connection eh, of uh, of the instrument with the lake. Uh, we make is uh, the maintenance of the instrumentation, and we we uh, uh, maintain it. Uh, clean and working to avoid any kind of trouble of, or problem in the results of the of the, the measurements so you can see some pictures of this work in the visual inspections uh, we have some rules based on the on the several uh, experiences of the the companies uh, Around the world, uh, we divide the, the the inspections in regular and informal. And we make the planning every day, and uh, we had we have a, a an event library to avoid 
uh, technicians to to write uh, different names of the same event. We call event an, instead of anomaly. And oh, sorry, the the events are encoded, and they have the, an address by coordinates x, y, and h. So everyone can goes to can go to the the same uh, to see that that event that recorded and and find it. And uh, we we put in our data field database the the length or the extensions or or the areas or of the 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 event depends on which event we are treating. Uh, we make the classification of the of the event by magnitude and hazard level. So this allows uh, the, the engineers to, to, to make decisions on which one we should uh, uh, start to to work on. Uh, I I bring some pictures of uh, of the <clears throat> of the visual inspections. This is upstream is an upstream inspection we made. So here is the 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 unfolding uh, connection. The uh, for to the left we have the Rockfield Dam, and this one is a buttress dam. The right the left connection uh, dam. These are the piers of uh, of uh, the 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 spillway uh, by an upstream inspection. This one is a, a downstream inspection made when the 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 river level was very uh, down, and this one is the slope uh, after the ski jump. This is the ski jump of uh, of uh, the left the, the left ski jump of the the left shoot. This is the the central shoot. And we make these inspections by by boat and walking through this this parts of the slope. Uh, this one is inside of the powerhouse, the lever of machine uh, uh, covers. Uh, another pictures uh, we have uh, we have other pictures we uh, about the 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 spillway inspection. Now on the shoot, so we we could see some some things that are of the the structure, some some features of this the structure, and uh, some materials found in the on the on the on the slab. This one is the buttress dam and the hollow gravity dam pictures. Uh, another work we do in the in the Taipu is to is to uh, control the crack on the concrete structures in the concrete structures. In the past, was uh, was uh, we used the scaffold to to make this one by Mitsutoyo devices, and recently we tried to to use. Uh, 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 high resolution pictures to make this this analysis, but we had so many small cracks and and dirty and and, and dirty that uh, uh, complicated our analysis. So we could we de we decided to not use it uh, anymore. It's it's too expensive to. To use, uh, we make uh, the mapping of the seepage in foundation between the blocks of the buttress to see the 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 seepage in the in the 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 the, the, the fractures of the rock, so we can analyze the 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 flow 
uh, by the, the foundation. And uh, we are now are employing uh, technologies nowadays uh, uh, to, to improve our analysis. So this one are pictures of the multibin uh, used uh, in uh, in a uh, in, uh, in the surveillance we 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 make so you can see uh, that we have almost the same uh, feature of the when we we were constructing uh, Itaipu. Uh, the we are using the mobile mapping equipment to make a. Uh, 3D uh, images for use in in BIM uh, analysis. We are using modeling uh, and analysis by software to uh, ensure that the analysis uh, to 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 easy the analysis of the the the, the stability of the dam. We are using our laboratory uh, to make some special studies. Uh, these studies are uh, of uh, uh, mortar to 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 repair the the shoots, the slab of the shoots. So we are studying this and applying. And when the the shoot the 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 gates are open, the the flow of the water uh, can. Uh, help us to understand uh, how uh, how good is our our is our repair. Uh, we have a MEV that we are use using to analyze uh, the substract uh, of uh, the old uh, the old concrete. Uh, we analyze the water. Uh, uh, flowing by drains uh, to ensure that uh, the the substances uh, will not uh, uh, cause any any problem to the the, the dam. Uh, some another tests in laboratory uh, we do. I, I will not use so uh, not spend some time in this. Uh, information. Uh, another important thing we do is the uh, knowledge manage management. Uh, we consider that managing is an important uh, uh, type of asset. Uh, the the knowledge based on experience of the the, the engineers accumulated over time is important to to show to the new year new year uh, engineers uh, we developed a, a, a system for initial training and periodic recycling of the the members the technicians so they can access and every time they want any time they want to 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 see and to to remember, and uh, this complies the uh, explanatory videos and assessment and exercises, so they could train by themselves. We have a note a known team of engineers and technicians. Uh, yeah, they are crowded in the dam area, aiming to act quickly in the emergency situations. Uh, as I said, we have the knowledge management. The, the current team received knowledge from engineers and technicians who participated in the design and the construction of the plant. And nowadays, uh, we have a few of these these members of the design of in the construction. Of course, uh, we our staff participates. Uh, in association external committees like uh, Abraj and CBDB are Brazilian uh, 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 institutions 
and ICO, ASDSO, and RILEM are international uh, commissions. Uh, we are constant, constant training uh, the team uh, by courses and the participation in events. So you can see some pictures of them working in field. And each four years, we have a, uh, a meeting with an international board of civil consultants. They are specialists who participate in the design and construction phase of the Itaipu. Uh, they have international experience, of course, and the knowledge in hydraulics, hydrology, geotechnics, and concrete. Uh, uh, this, uh, as I said, this occurs in uh, each four years, and the last one in November 2022. And I thank you very much for the patience and the attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ettore, for your presentation. Uh, also, you, I'm asking you if you can stay with us until the Q&A session at the end. And now I am inviting the next two speakers, Stefan Hoppe and Ruben Sancho, who will talk about digital tools and solutions for dam and reservoir management. So Ruben Sancho is, has a PhD in civil engineering, and he is a member of the Technical Committee on Monitoring at Spancult. He is also a manager of the company Altius and technical director of ITEA Ingenieria. He has more than 15 years of experience in the hydraulic and ge geotechnical work sector. And Stefan Hoppe, he has a master's degree in civil engineering and international master's degree as BIM manager. He is also a member of the technical committee, but technical committee on dams and on Spanholt, and he works more than 20 years in the field of dam safety and surveillance. So I'm heading the microphone to you too. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> can you hear me and see my screen? Yes, we can hear you, we can see the screen. Great. Okay, so we divided our presentation in two parts. Uh, I will start and then Ruben will talk about more details in the in the last 15 minutes of our of our slot. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, the word digitalization is something that we hear everywhere and uh, every time, actually every day. And it's supposed to make our lives easier and better. But is it really like this? So that's why I would like to uh, show a little bit what does it mean for our dams and how can we benefit from it. First of all, I will give some uh, basic ideas about digitalization and BIM and then present uh, some different uh, solutions like uh, digital glasses, uh, dam safety management platforms, and 360 images. And later, Ruben will enter also in more detail with, uh, uh, with other solutions. Digitalization is about uh, optimizing processes and organizing data. So there are a lot of tools on the market that help us to bring the information together to make it easier to, to make decisions. So it's uh, very helpful on the first point of view. On the other hand, it's not only organizing existing information, but we also get more information. There are scanners, different sensors that have more geometric information. We have to handle them as well. And now there are also drones flying around our dams, taking photos, making videos. And somehow we have to, to handle all this information. Digitalization in the construction industry uh, is, is a bit special because it's uh, not linked to an abstract project, but to a physical infrastructure. And this helps us to make a visual organization of the data based 
on a on a model, the two D or three D model. So in this way, we can combine our model with uh, or the data model with a geometric model, and then add additional information. So then we don't have only a 3D model, can be 4D, 5D, depends on the information that we include, the schedule, the costs, facility management, health and safety. But uh, finally for us, uh, it's also dam safety or dam safety management. Um, an important aspect about uh, this data management is not to have it isolated. It should be integrated in different uh, dam safety tasks. Here, uh, I show you a scheme from the ICOLD bulletin on surveillance. It's uh, already a couple of years old, from 2008, but uh, where we can already see how it, dam safety management is connected with other tasks like surveillance, safety reviews, and maintenance works. And then it helps also to connect between the different work processes. What else is inform, uh, important for information management? Actually, there I learned quite a lot from my children because we create a lot of data uh, now also with, with the drones and other sensors, but uh, we have to select the, the best of it and then organize this data. And when it's organized, then we can do something with it. And this should not only be beautiful, it should also be useful in order to help us. Another aspect is sharing information. This is something my children don't like so much. I guess you always like to, to share the information that you get with other people and the collaboration. There are different uh, platforms that uh, help us to centralize the information and share it with different experts like geotechnical specialists, monitoring technicians, surveyors, dam safety engineers, also with external consultants and um, maybe also the authority. And uh, it's not only about sharing information, also feeding the, the, the platform with new additional information. And in this way, we can bring the dam site and the office together because uh, on the dam site, we get the information, but on the, in the office, we make the decisions that uh, in the end have to be implemented in uh, on the dam when we go over to to the tools uh quite interesting uh solution for uh for improving the communication are these let's call them digital glasses they are maybe a bit like a mobile phone they have a small display have a camera um, and with them you can make a teleconference and talk with experts in the uh, that are in the office. So in this way, on the dam, you achieve uh, remote assistance for visual inspections or, for example, operation and maintenance works. And this is especially interesting when you are when you need immediate solutions and you don't have the time to travel, or if it's not possible to travel, for example, in pandemic situations, or if simply you just don't have uh, there's not, not the budget for uh, for traveling costs. Also for training, it is good. And uh, if you compare it with a, a video call with a mobile with a mobile phone, the good thing about these glasses is you've got two hands free. That means you can move around freely and safely uh, around the dam. You can hold the handrail, write something down, and uh, do certain works. And at the same time, you get uh, help from uh, ex uh, external experts. Regarding the model, it's uh, not so easy as in the Wild West when you say this is the good one and this is uh, the bad uh, model. It always depends uh, what it is needed for. And uh, quite often, even the ugly one might be the best solution. So it depends on if you want to make a public presentation, if you want training, if you want uh, a model for operation and maintenance or analysis of monitoring data or structural calculation, you need different kinds of models and should always uh, define the model uh, in the way how you need it. 
Um, the BIM solutions give us the opportunity that we combine uh, the geometry with additional information uh, by adding different parameters. For example, here with uh, spillway gate, we include uh, we can include photos, dimension information about the manufacturer or operation works that have to be done. Or here we can see a pendulum with uh, calibration values and other information that is needed in order to work with uh, this uh, monitoring device. The next step would be to uh, uh, link more data to, to the model, like uh, we did it here in, in this example, in this online dam information system, where we link monitoring data, visual inspections, and uh, different uh, field procedures. In the upper part, we can see the model of the dam, which can be moved freely. And below is uh, the database with different uh, functions and configurations. When we have a look at the lower part, for example, there is a list of the monitoring data, uh, also some charts in order to visualize it in a, in a better way. We can choose, for example, the sensors that have triggered or exceeded a, a threshold value and then synchronize it with a model and directly find uh, the sensors that have been chosen. We can get closer to them and also make comparison to see if there's some other sensors that might give us a clue about what uh, or why this uh, threshold value has been triggered and see if it's in other uh, sensors, it is the same. As we have a model, we are not just depend on some two, uh, 2D drawings. We can move the model and get a better impression about the um, location of the sensors and the dimensions. Another kind of information that we included is uh, some forms from uh, field work, like the sensor status, visual inspections, or uh, photo documentation and incidents. And uh, the idea is on the field to fill in these uh, forms or mobile devices, and then they are directly uh, synchronized with the database and uh, immediately available. And the idea is not just to manage afterwards the forms, but uh, the information that is inside these forms. For example, here we have a breakdown of different maintenance incidents and below a breakdown of the visual inspections. And uh, there we can, for example, select the incidents that uh, are in progress. We have also information about if they are related to a certain block or a gallery. And we can also synchronize it with the model and see directly where these maintenance works have to be done. Or we do it in the other way. We choose an area on the dam and then see if there are some pending maintenance works. Other uh, information that uh, we included are observations from visual inspections. Uh, we have a list of different uh, uh, incidents or observations, and then we can can choose, for example, I want to have a look for for the C page. Uh, gets uh, I get close to it. See, there is a um, there's a mark where it has been observed, and then. I can get access directly to, to photos or additional documentation. So here we can see on the down, downstream side where this C page uh, on the dam has been seen. And now this is the interesting part of bringing information together because now we, in the same database, we have our monitoring data, but also results from the visual inspections. And in this way, we uh, can bring this together and get better conclusions. Of course, it is can also be seen as a document manager uh, to include uh, 2D drawings or photos. And this helps us to assign photos to uh, different areas of the dam and find them uh, very quickly. Um, another uh, field of application for, for models is the virtual reality. These are maybe uh, models that have less information but are, are nicer. And uh, they are quite good for public communication or for internal meetings. 
and the visualization of uh, information also for uh, for training. So you can make a virtual visit on your computer or even with uh, three-dimensional uh, with the virtual reality glasses. The preparation of models uh, can take quite a lot of time and uh, is more cost effective. So maybe a different alternative are the 360 images there it is possible just uh, in a few days uh, prepare a model with uh, with site visit by using uh, special cameras. It's even possible to make it with mobile phones. Um, and uh, in this way, uh, you can also make another kind of uh, virtual visit of the dam. This uh, models include obviously different kinds of information, but it's also possible to add more information like here in this, in this example, we've got bisometers and uh, this information can uh, easily be added. And if you repeat this kind of, uh, of visits, so it's possible to com compare, for example, every year or every five years, these uh, photos with uh, each other. Uh, it's also possible to um, uh, add uh, hyperlinks with more information and even measure inside these models to get uh, also geometric information. So before Ruben starts, I just give some uh, uh, first conclusions. So data and information must be managed efficiently. And uh, by applying new technology, we can make them really useful. But it's not always the most expensive or the nicest solution, which is the best. So always focus on what it is needed for. And it's not only about technology, it's also about the people and processes. So uh, it's important to implement, involve everybody who has to use uh, the software or, or the solution so that it is really uh, working properly. And in this way, we increase uh, the knowledge about our dams, can improve the decision-making, working procedures, save costs, and uh, finally also improve the safety of our dams. So thank you very much. And uh, then I would like to pass the word to uh, Ruben. You can see my screen, Corinne? We can hear you, but we don't see your screen yet. Now we can also no. see your screen, yes. Okay, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you, Mateja, and thank you to Spancol for allowing me to be in this webinar. It's a pleasure for me. We're going to start with the index, which is divided into six main sections. The first one is data collection and types of devices. In second place, we have talked about device selection and then about CD modeling. We will continue with an application of 3D models for monitoring. Then we'll see some cases studies and we'll end with the conclusions. We can classify data collection depending on the type of device to be used, ground, aerial, or aquatic. About ground devices, there are heavy and light devices. Some light devices doesn't need parking and we can do the capture data by working, like we can see in this picture. The quality of the point cloud is not like a static device, but it can be appropriate on certain occasions. 
in our experience, although the manufacturer says that they are appropriate for galleries, they are not adequate for indoor use because loose is seen, because loose signal is seen and doesn't allow post processing. Within the lab device, there are static ones. This device must be static during the capture, like in this image. The light device are on the tripod. In addition, some models allow the capture of 360 images and LiDAR data. This is a LiDAR data picture, which allows to have an interesting virtual tour like we have seen before with Stefan. If we need a high performance, there are heavy devices. It's important to say that this high performance is according to the technical sheet. These devices are more difficult to handle and especially to correct location. Therefore, they're suitable, they are suitable for flight environments, but not by large structures or structures with difficult accesses. Dams, for example, are located in river beds, ravines, etc. Therefore, have a complex position and not homogeneous point clouds with parts of the dam with different density and noise, and for sure, shallow areas, because it's difficult to have visual of all area of the dam from the ground. In the second section, we'll talk more about that. Besides, we need a great deal of time to capture, and therefore a high cost. On the other hand, there are aerial devices. In the case of nonlinear structures, like dams, which have a vertical, a big vertical component captured by multi-rotor drones, is appropriate. This allows covering and therefore data collection from any location. If we have vegetation, for example, in access roads, with the last generation of LiDAR drones, the filtering is automatic, and therefore the 3D model is easy to make. We can see here, we can see the ground perfectly under the vegetation. This is before the filtering, and this is after the filtering. Finally, in data collection, we talk about aquatic devices. They are monobin and multibin ecosonder. The monobin capture one line with real data. That is, we only have real data in a line under the consender. For example, in this picture, we only have real data in these lines. And therefore, we have a digital terrain model by interpolation. However, with a multibin, we can capture areas with real data. All this area is captured with the consonder. Therefore, we don't have to interpolate. For example, in this case, here we have a dam, and if we take a cross section, we can see the 3D point cloud and the cross section. This is the dam facing, and this is the suction cone of the bottom outlet. Before starting data collection, it's important to know the structure that will be digitalized, and therefore the methodology for get a high, a high quality point cloud. Usually, prescriptions are according to the technical sheets, but it's not the fundamental aspect. The most important are the boundary conditions. In dams, there are discharge channel, intakes, spillways, and more different elements. Then, choose the device should be taken into account all these conditions. With a drone, we don't need parking spaces. However, with a drone device, we'll have, we'll have a lot of positioning and will be far from the, from the dam. Regarding to the object device distance and object device incidence angle from the device to dam, is always maintained with a drone and therefore we'll have a device adapted to our structure, an homogeneous point cloud. That implies real and precise geometry. 
or whether with our own device the distance and the incidence angle are different. For example, in this case, we can position in our and our device, maybe here, maybe in this other row, or in this. But for sure it's impossible to position in it in all this area or in this area. And inside the channel, maybe it's possible, but for sure very dangerous. That implies that we'll have an heterogeneous point cloud and shadow areas. Now we can go to modeling from the real point cloud and extract easily necessary sections. For example, here we can extract a section from the spillway. And then we can check and review elevation in absolute coordinates. Also, we can see elevation from an area in a range of colors. For example, we can see it on a spillway dip. It allows us to know where it will start to pour. This red area is higher than this yellow area. Then it will start to pour through the yellow area. It's important to know that either with photogrammetry or LiDAR, we'll have a homogeneous and your reference outdoor point cloud. We can import the point cloud into the design software and start to draw the 3D model. Finally, if we have taken photos of the structure, we can give texture to the model. Okay, now we are going to see that once a structure or terrain is digitalized, we can control their movements or variations. Then, if we have a point cloud of a structure or two different times, this is the upper part of the dam, we can compare it and show their difference. This case is the upper part of the dam, and we have the movements value of the arch of, of this arch gravity dam. Here we have a rock massive case. If we compare two point class of different times, we'll have their movements. But the most interesting thing about this methodology is that we can see 3D variations and interpret it. In this case, we have here high values of movements, near to 45 centimeters. And there are null values. This means that there is a crack and a possible detachment all of this part. If we go to the 3D model, we can see the crack. We can apply this methodology to small and large surfaces. In my opinion, the next case is an interesting example of things that we, that we can do from a digitalized dam. From the aerial point cloud that we can see in this image, we can make the digital terrain model. And then we simulate the excavation of the foundation from as maps. This is the foundation simulated. Besides, we simulate visible surface drain layers of the foundation. From the geological map and knowing deep and deep direction, we simulate the drain layers. This is the drain layer simulated on the foundation. Therefore, we can choose the best places of draining to drain the foundation. In the 3D model, we can see the best places to drain. In this other case, with the aerial outdoor point cloud, this is the aerial outdoor point cloud, and gallery indoor point cloud. The scan of the gallery was made with a light device and captured with, and captured with LiDAR and 360 images. This is the LiDAR and this is the 360 image. If both point clouds are your reference and in the same coordinate system, system we can overlay. Here are overlay both, both point clouds. 
here in this case, we're going to know if the gallery was under the spillway. We can check it in this model. And in that case, we want to know the distance between them. We got it from this section in the 3D model. As we've seen before with Stefan, we can make a, a big model. The last case we, we, have, we are going to see integrates an aerial point cloud. This is the aerial point cloud and a bathymetric with a monobeam echo sounder point cloud. Is this. And we integrate a testification of a geolo geological survey. With this model, we can extract real sections. This is the section that we extract from the model. And the necessary anchors to improve the safety coefficient of the dam could be defined without reaching the reservoir. We can see in the cross section this distance between the anchors, the anchors are in blue, and the reservoir. This is our safety distance. Also, in this area, is this model. We can extract from the CD model the minimum length. This is the minimum length that we need to anchor it to the foundation. To finish, we'll see very quickly the main conclusions. When choosing the device, it's not only the characteristic of the manufacturer's technical data sheet that must be assessed. We must know what we need and the purpose. And based on this, choose the device that best suits its boundary conditions. Outdoors, the choice of data collection with drones is usually the most appropriate. Indoors, drones are beginning to be marketed, but nowadays, the use of terrestrial device is more appropriate. The integration of point cloud of each element is done is simple. And the, from, the, from the point cloud, we can easily extract sections and digitalize our structure in 3D. Finally, the comparison of two point clouds provides us with the variation between both. That's all, and thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan and Ruben. Also, both of you, I'm kindly asking if you can stay uh, until the end of, so you can participate in the Q&A. And now it's the time for our last presentation. The title of the presentation is Understanding Accuracy, Uncertainty, and Automation Opportunities for Civil CFD Modeling, the Carrisome dam case study. The presenter is Jonathan Bouchard, and I guess we are now again going on the other side of the Atlantic, so good morning to you, who is a CFD engineer as at Flow 3D Hydro and has a vast experience in modeling uh, software development in the field, and we are very looking forward to your presentation, so please. All right. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. We can see your presentation. Perfect. Well, uh, good morning or uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are. Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, today I'll be uh, taking you to the world of computational fluid dynamics simulations, um, presenting you some of the work we have done on the uh, Garrison Dam. Um, this was prepared actually for a workshop uh, on this dam for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers a little bit than uh, more than uh, one years ago. And uh, we took this as a case study to explore the kind of accuracy, uncertainty, and uh, automation opportunities when modeling spillways using CFD. So um, as explained, uh, yeah, my name is Jonathan Bouchard. I'm a senior CFD engineer. Um, I focus on the water uh, applications uh, at the Flow Science. Uh, we are a software company that has been developing um, CFD simulation software uh, called Flow3D for over 40 years. Uh, my background is in mechanical, industrial engineering, um, CFD, and other 3D um, engineering technologies. 
And it's worth noting that um, a lot of the material that is in that pre this presentation have been created by my colleagues, Brian Fox and John Wendelbo. So uh, my game plan for this presentation today is first, uh, we'll cover some um, of the project background. Uh, we will explain CFD models, how we set those up and what uh, they look like. Also discuss about the comparison with um, laboratory measurements. And then we'll discuss uh, accuracy and hardware consideration uh, before um, yeah, uh, my final take home message. And yes, yeah, so by the way, you see this video here on um, the right. Well, um, what is this? Um, looks like real footage or CGI, but uh, it's what modern CFD looks like actually. Uh, we just have a very high quality um, and accurate surface representation. So uh, that brings us to the first question. Um, First thing first, what is CFD? Well, CFD or computational fluid dynamic is a simulation tool that provides a highly accurate, detailed and dynamic representation of how the flow interact with its environment. So in the case uh, of a spillway like this one, um, you're going to see the detail of uh, the wave uh, runner up, the uh, super elevation uh, around the bridge piers, and the free surface downstream of the spillway. So this is what CFD does. It's a tool that gives you a very uh, precise and accurate representation of what's happening uh, to your flow. And it's typically used to uh, predict fluid behavior from which we can extract information for analysis or design decision. So uh, let's start with um, the project background. Um, so the material I will be presenting today was done for a workshop we did back in uh, December, 2022. So we had the opportunity to organize this workshop on the topic of CFD modeling for 80 participants from the US Army Corps of Engineers. And we used the Garrison Dam as the backdrop of this study. So we focused on uh, the spillway uh, that we see here on the right, but also on the flood control tunnel, um, which is an underground tunnel um, that discharges the flow away from the re reservoir and downstream. And that's the example that we used to cover uh, CFD methods. So uh, where is that located? Uh, well, of course, it's in the United States in North uh, Dakota. Uh, so we have uh, an aerial view here. Uh, we have the spillway and the uh, flood control tunnel on the other side. And uh, for that spillway, we have gate controlled OG bays, actually 28 of them that are flowing into that spillway. And if we zoom in, we can see what it looks like in a bit more detail. So these are the two areas of interest for this um, uh, workshop that we did and uh, the work I will be presenting on. So um, a little bit of background. Uh, there was a technical memorandum, uh, including some physical uh, laboratory work uh, that was done back in 1956. Uh, with a whole bunch of information and results from their hydraulic lab, uh, including uh, many uh, different um, models. So um, 1 to 41 uh, spillway crest model, uh, a 1 to 100 comprehensive spillway, uh, 1 to 25 um, model of the flood control tunnel, and a 1 to 50 uh, model of the stilling basin and the, flow, the flood control tunnels. And this report, uh, which is, by the way, available online, has all of these details. And uh, for this uh, work, we uh, focused mainly on the spillway part, part four and part two, which is the flood control tunnel. So here <clears throat> is, how, um, is what the uh, physical uh, model looks like. Uh, on the left, we have the comprehensive model with um, the reservoir and spillway. Um, then we have um, a flow, well, um, larger model of the uh, sectional um, spillway model. And here on the lower right, we have the gated flood control tunnel, uh, at least the scaled version. 
uh, with a reservoir on this side and uh, this radial gate that we see here in more of a close-up view um, that can open and close to discharge water. So this is what the technical drawings looks like. Um, so we have the different tiers of the spillway. Uh, this is the profile here of the spillway. Um, there is a radial gate also uh, on the spillway, which controls the flow. Um, same thing, uh, technical drawings here of that uh, flood control tunnel. So we have water on that side. Uh, there's this uh, emergency sliding gate, um, the radial gate, um, that uh, controls the flow downstream and there's an uh, air um, supply uh, tunnel. Um, so this is all of the data we have. Uh, so we had access to these rating curves um, first for uh, the tunnel. So we add rating curves for different gate openings. Um, so a quarter opening, half open, three quarter and fully open. Uh, same thing for the spillway. We add uh, um, rating curves for different gate openings from three foot to 15 foot, but also um, the fully open. Uh, we also add uh, water profiles at the center of the spillway gate bay uh, for two different pool elevation. Um, so uh, 1,849 foot and uh, 1,859. So a 10 foot difference between uh, these two pools. And finally, we had all of these pressure readings uh, along the spillway crest. Um, so they put the piezometer. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, as you can see, we had a lot of data to play with. So we took this um, actual uh, lab data uh, and use it to compare uh, with our CFD models, which are uh, physical, uh, sorry, numerical models. So we're comparing the physical world with the numerical world. And um, yeah, uh, so we uh, add access to the CAD model of the spillway with all of the detail. As you can see, it's a pretty large uh, structure. A little bit more of a close-up view here. Uh, there are 28 of these bays with uh, gates. Um, and this is what the uh, flood control tunnel looks like. Um, it starts with um, an 18 by 24 foot um, rectangular channel that transition into a 22 foot uh, diameter pipe. Um, so below is the detail of the gate, which uh, act as the primary hydraulic control during its opening. Uh, but once again, the, the gate is completely open, um, the, act, the hydraulic control becomes the pipe itself. Uh, so there's a switch going on because the surface of this uh, circular um, pipe is actually smaller. So it becomes the area of constriction. So um, when the gate is almost fully open, the pipe transition to being um, fully pressurized flow and is completely full. So the CAD model uh, based on the report drawing, so we recreated it in the CAD software, uh, including both the emergency gate and the radial gate. So um, now let's show you or discuss the different CFD models uh, we created. So this is what um, the CFD model looks like on the right for the gated tunnel system. So what you do is that basically you take the CAD model, uh, you define water elevation and you basically just push water through the system. So that's kind of how things work. Um, we can see it here. Uh, as you can notice, we have the options of defining some objects are, are moving um, like this gate, for example. So we can model the full transient um, condition in our model. So after the gate opening, we can see that, uh, well, I missed it, but we can see that the pipe becomes uh, fully pressurized. And um, when the gate close, we see it uh, depressurized. So we can model these types of behavior. So here's what uh, the CFD model looks like for the spillway. So, um, uh, okay, you get uh, an idea. So by the way, those have been set up using Flow3D Hydro. Um, such models are quite simple to set up um, and run typically. Uh, like typically they run pretty fast. Um, so if you're wondering, like setting up a model like this um, spillway that we just seen, 
takes maybe like 20, 30 minutes. And um, depending on the resolution you want to run, it can take um, between a few hours to um, a day maybe. So um, the workflow in a nutshell, uh, how that works is that you bring in your 3D geometry, which can be a CAD model. It can also be terrain data, um, bathymetry, or a mix of different types of data. And then we put a mesh around it. Um, so that's our simulation zone. So the size of the mesh cells um, is what's defining your resolution and uh, accuracy. So we'll discuss that more in depth later. Um, and uh, typically these models, um, so yeah, we see uh, the meshed uh, version of the CAD. Uh, typically these uh, simulations run on a workstation with the 95% of the time, but we have a unified solver. So you can also run these model on a cluster and use up to thousands of cores if you want. And um, as far as runtime goes, it can take minutes if you do something basic or um, a day or multiple day if you're doing something really big and complex. It all depends on the mesh density and the bundling approach that you use. So what are the different modeling approaches? So we'll go through different modeling approaches and how they've been used in um, that workshop or that project on the Garrison Dam spillway. So um, because we can attack uh, modeling problems in various different ways. So uh, first of all, like if your flow is kind of uh, homogeneous in the transverse direction, you can just um, take a slice. So this is a 2D vertical slice using just a single cell in the vertical direction. And this will run very, very quickly. So in a matter of minutes, but it still gives you a lot of valuable information. So not all uh, information, but you do get a lot and it's uh, very um, valuable information. So the next step in complexity is to say, okay, like, okay, we have this, um, I've shown you before, we have this uh, reduced sectional model of the spillway. So let's just model one bay. And also to make things simpler or take a shortcut, uh, since it's uh, symmetrical, uh, we can just model one half and do um, a symmetry uh, with the other side. So of course, this will not run as fast as a 2D slice, but um, all of a sudden you, start getting some of the uh, head loss and tree dimensionality of the flow for this one bay, like this action here near the pier. And this will now give you very, very good information about how the flow will interact with the piers and the structure. So here's what the model looks like uh, once it's been mirrored. We also applied uh, ray tracing or like a rendering to make it look more realistic, but you can plot all different types of variables like um, uh, velocity, uh, pressures um, on the fluid. Uh, so that's just um, like a realistic rendering. And um, yeah, so uh, we did the mirroring and you now have a full bay and a half um, replicating actually what they did with that uh, sectional model in the lab, in fact. So uh, we can really now get the interaction or, or blockage with those peers. So the next modeling approach, let's say we zoom out and we look at the entire width of the spillway. So here we just see an elevated view, but um, see in that model, we have all 28 bays. So, okay, so you have, um, so that's something you can do with CFD. Of course, it will take longer to run, so probably a few days, but now you have modeled the entire width, not just a single bay. So I was talking about the uh, different uh, ways of presenting the data. Here we see the velocity field. So um, let's say we um, so we went to the general like uh, so we took like the, the the full width. But if we take a step back and I uh, look again at this picture, uh, we see the general configuration and we notice that the approach flow um, is not uniform. So we have different velocities coming up from different uh, direction. That's because um, the approach channel is curved. So let's say there will be zone with higher velocity and uh, some zones with uh, lower velocity. And of course, this will affect the discharge both locally and as the whole uh, spillway uh, capacity. So um, it's something that might be interesting to take into account. 
So another level of sophistication we can add to this model is to take into account these approach flow conditions using a hybrid approach. What I mean by hybrid is that uh, we can use a 3D mesh block to have full accuracy near the spillway where the flow is dynamic. But then um, we can use a simplified shallow water model upstream. So um, the goal of uh, such a 2D shallow water model is to have faster runtime. Um, because we say it's 2D because it assumes a constant uh, velocity across the depth of the fluid, so it's depth average. So And uh, for that upstream portion, that assumption is valid because uh, there's little um, three-dimensionality to the flow. And by the way, these two um, different mesh blocks are automatically integrated in the software. So with that being said, let's look at how these CFD models compare with the lab results from that 1956 memorandum. So first, let's take a look at our rating curves. So we have rating curves for the flood control tunnels for these different gate openings and upstream uh, reservoir elevation. So for that comparison, we used a 2D vertical flight approach because the flow just happened to be extremely close to two dimensional in real life. And we actually got some pretty good results, even with the 2D slides. Uh, not perfect, but really good. So you see the CFD results in red and lab measurement in black. And we did the same thing for the spillway uh, with a 2D gate um, and uh, also got some uh, very good uh, results using that 2D slice approach. Um, of course, we could do that. Uh, and we use that approach uh, for the no peers, because in the lab, they do the test with and without peers. <clears throat> so uh, when you don't have peers, it's um, good. Um, and you can use that slice. Uh, it's a good strategy. And uh, once again, we have very good agreement. Um, and the nice thing with this type of vertical 2D slice is it's, run, it's running in minutes and um, you get very good results. So now if we go to a more complex 3D approach, let's say we have the peers, um, we can also integrate things like different gate openings. And um, so we have here uh, the results from a 3D model with all the different gate openings and all different upstream elevations. So as you can see, all with all these red dots, these are our CFD models results. So we did a matrix of run and we overall see a robust and accurate solution across uh, all flow rates. So we also looked at the pressure distribution uh, along the spillway. So we can see where they put uh, or where they had these uh, pressure probes in the lab. And we replicated that with our 3D model on the right. And in this case, uh, there are two sets of results, one uh, with the peers and one without the peers. Um, as you can see, in both cases, uh, Flow3D Hydro provides uh, just an excellent reading of pressure. So the red line is the pressure along the spillway from our CFD model. And the black dots are measurements from the um, experiments. So a really good agreement. Uh, that was also done with um, the same pressure measurement with different gate openings. Uh, so with a 10 foot and 15 foot gate opening. So um, different pressure readings, of course, but we can also model these uh, other scenarios with um, pretty good fidelity. So the same thing was done for free surface elevation. So here we see um, the comparison uh, with the CFD, which are the colored line. And the black dots are the lab um, uh, water uh, elevation profiles for the two different pool elevations. Um, so pretty, the numerical is pretty close to the physical world um, there. And finally, um, if we model the, the entire thing, um, let's look at the CFD result. So this is um, the full discharge that was calculated using that full model. And this other model, uh, this other number, sorry, was actually um, uh, calculated using the result from a single bay and then multiplying by a 28, so all of these bays. So as we can see, the actual uh, full width number is smaller because it considered the actual head loss because of the approach flow condition I discussed about. Um, so we actually measure that capacity loss with that um, full width model with the uh, upstream uh, model as well. So it came pretty close to the actual um, 
lab measurement um, between three to five percent, which is um, extremely close. Um, so yeah, all in all, what we get from this is that a CFD offers you a tool that is uh, accurate, but it also multifaceted. So you can uh, choose between different modeling approach. You can get very quick results using a 2D slice, um, which is a bit simplified. You can get quick results with uh, a local uh, 3D model like we did for the single bay. Uh, but you can also model the full width with all 28 bays and also include um, the uh, approach flow conditions. So you have all of these different level of sophistication, different modeling approaches that gives you different info with different level of accuracy. But uh, when you choose the right approach and use it properly, you can get very good agreement with the physical lab data as we've seen. But you know, there are still some potential uh, questions that need to be asked when you do CFD. Uh, is my model any good? Um, so for our workshop, we had the chance to have physical lab data. That's fantastic. But sometimes you don't have access to that data. So question is like, oh, sorry, how wrong is my model? Um, you know, when we do training, we always say that uh, any CFD model is wrong. The question is, uh, is it wrong by 1%, by 10%, or is it wrong by 100%? Uh, and so is it quantifiably wrong? How can I use this result? What's the cost, computationally speaking? So these are all good questions that everybody should be ask, asking when looking or thinking about CFD model. So for the Garrison Dam workshop, we did a lot of sensitivity, sensitivity analysis. So we took some of the discharge and we looked at the difference between uh, the results we got and the lab measurements. So you have the uh, percentage of uh, difference with between the CFD and the lab measurement. And we did different runs with different resolution. So this stuff point cloud is with the coarse mesh, uh, 2.2 feet cells. We have the intermediate mesh, um, a finer mesh with one, 0.1 foot cell, and finally a fine mesh with um, 0 0.6 foot cell. So we see that um, with the coarse mesh, the overall envelope is within 10 to 15 percent, which is already great, by the way. But okay, if we refine the mesh and we use a finer mesh, then it goes all this entire cloud goes down to eight to uh, four to eight percent. Uh, so we improve our accuracy by going finer. And finally, if we use an extremely fine mesh, we get uh, between 1% and 4%, which is uh, practically within uh, experimental uh, accuracy. So what's the conclusion? Uh, the conclusion is that uh, when you refine the mesh, uh, your results become more and more uh, accurate. And uh, that's what we saw here. So... Um, yeah, so this is, like in summary, this is really important. Uh, accuracy improves when you refine your mesh. So this is the number one driver of accuracy. And you can plot it in um, various ways. So this is um, for uh, the flood tunnel. Um, we have the lab data in gray. And then uh, the red is the coarse model. The yellow is the medium. And the blue is the fine. And you see that in every case, as you refine the mesh, you're getting closer to the truth. So um, the meshing uh, does move the CFD solution consist consistently toward the lab data. And uh, accuracy uh, consistently improve as you refine the mesh. So that's the moral of the story here. So we did um, um, kind of the same type of analysis. This is a mesh conversion study for the flood control tunnel. So um, by increasing the number of cells, so by going with smaller cells across the opening of the gate, you can see that uh, as you refine your mesh, you go from 11% up to down to um, like one or 2%, which is uh, pretty good. But of course, when you reduce your mesh size, the total number of cells in your simulation will increase. So that will affect uh, processing time. So that brings me to, um, my last topic, runtime. So let's say we have a model like the one we see on the right, which might take uh, maybe 24 hours to run on a 10 core computer. If we run it on 40 cores, it goes down to uh, eight, nine hours. Then if you put it on a cluster, it might only take an hour. So once again, here, there's no secret. Uh, the more cores you have on your processing machine, the faster things run. <clears throat> And we did a bunch of 
benchmark with different types of architecture, uh, different chips, uh, Intel, AMD, and um, also uh, different types of architecture of what's available in the market in terms of a cluster, um, AWS, uh, Azure, and others. And we kind of see the trend here. So it's uh, the runtime uh, for CPU cores. So of course there are some discrepancy, um, <clears throat> some hardware uh, almost like uh, for the same number of core might run like twice as fast as another one. But the general trend as you see is that the more core you have, the faster the runtime. And yeah, uh, one final, um, thing is that uh, the other dimension of modern CFD is automation. So when dealing with such a large number of simulation, like the one we did for this workshop, we don't want to do it, uh, any of this work by hand, so we can fully automate uh, all of these simulation. So we specify um, what mesh size we want to use, what gate rotation, what uh, water elevation in the pool. And then we push that and we uh, all the simulations are automated, so you get um, the flow rates, so you have your inputs, you run your simulation with all of these different inputs, um, you can automatically extract data and post-process the results and perform any calculation you need. So uh, final take home messages. Um, first of all, what we wanted to do with the US Army Corps of Engineer uh, was to demonstrate ease of use. Of course, okay, we didn't do any simulation today, so that was just a condensed version. But um, as a software company, we really focus on making uh, the model setup really simple. Um, there's a rapid learning curve. Uh, meshing is really simple and fast and um, leveraging a computer resource to have fast runtime. Uh, but in my presentation, I wanted to give you <clears throat> also an overview of the different modeling approaches uh, using slices, vertical slice, 2D, 3D model, uh, hybrid approach. Um, that gives you different type of info um, and can be really accurate. All of these things are robustly quantifiable. So um, let's say as a modeler, when you do um, and you've done mesh study, you, pre you basically know ahead of time, okay, if I use this mesh resolution or this type of structure, I can expect this type of accuracy. <clears throat> and finally, uh, all of this is very well integrated uh, with automation and high performance computing. So you can be really efficient doing these types of analysis, uh, like the one we did, or all these simulations we did for the workshops. And uh, yeah, so CFD is becoming more and more mainstream. Um, it can be used now over a wide variety of water-related projects, um, and it's a great tool for engineering, engineering and productivity. So yeah, on that, I uh, thank you for your attention and uh, yeah, I'll be glad to answer um, any questions. And if you have, you want to reach out to me, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn and by email. And just by the way, I'm just putting this little video It was done for the Isabella Dam. Um, it's once again, data that was provided by the uh, US Army Corps of Engineer. So we're showing um, a slow velocity over um, terrain data. Uh, with the satellite map, and then this is uh, ray tracing. So this was done more of a, a post-processing uh, exercise. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for a very interesting presentation. Yes, um, Q&A session is coming very soon. Before that, just a short presentation. Uh, can I ask you to stop sharing the screen? Thank you. And now I will share my screen. So just a short final presentation from my side. So again, hello to everyone. Uh, nice to see you here in a large number. I will briefly talk about the I Code Young Professionals Forum. And I will start by explaining, because I guess some of you have never heard of us, what does this even mean? So I Code Young Professionals Forum is a body within I Code, and our mission is to 
aim and to target young professionals in the field of DEMS and in a very broad field, not just structural engineers, but all professionals in the branch uh, in the beginning of the career. And by definition, young professionals in iCult are the professionals that are younger than 40 years. So our goal is to encourage young professionals and to provide mentor opportunities, provide opportunities for knowledge transfer, and provide opportunities to network and to share experience. So for example, this webinar today is one of those examples of our actions. Moreover, we also want to inspire young professionals to become active within ICOLT and within the national committees that are included in the ICOLT. By the way, ICOLT has more than 100 member countries. And then furthermore, uh, we try to encourage the young professionals that also within their national committees that they form their own, their own young professional networks and start being involved also in the work of the technical committee and the beginning as the observers and so, and then more and more. Because if not else, technical committees are also a very good place to gain new knowledge, to grow connections. So the story of the young professionals started in 2009 and we were activated in the year 2011 with the first inaugural meeting. Since then, we meet in person at least once a year at the ICOLT annual conferences. And in between, we remain active on regional events and also we remain active online. And at this moment, I would also like to acknowledge the past chairs. Let's say we are now the fifth generations and the four chairs before me are the ones who paved the way for us to continue. The board of iCult Young Professionals consists of six members and one chair. All of the positions are voted and our term of office is typically three years. We aim to be representative and diverse. We want to have a member of the board who is also a member of the national committee who is organizing the next iCult meeting so we can be involved in the program of the next uh, iCult conference. And uh, we also have, uh, we, we have full trust in the nominations of the national committee. So if you want to become a member of the board, the elections are every year. For example, this year in New Delhi, during our official meeting, there will be two positions open. And to become a candidate at the, at the elections, you need the support of your national committee or your national committee has to nominate you. And then you have to be present during the meeting where you have an opportunity for an elevator pitch to present yourself. Then all the young professionals attending the meeting have a right to vote. And the two, rep the two members of, on the elections that will have the most votes will be the one that will be elected to work uh, with our board for the next three years. And yeah, the call will be announced two months before the meeting in New Delhi. The meeting in New Delhi is in September, so you can expect the call to be announced online in the middle of the summer. Now, we also serve as an umbrella for the national YPF. Uh, we provide support. So, so far, 33 ICOLT countries have established their own national branches. Since there are more than 100 ICOLT member countries, we, we still have room for improvement. So if you don't see your country here, mark with an orange color. If you want to change this, activate yourself. If, if you need the support, contact us and we will help you in any way we can. The activities that I'm talking about, uh, the week when the conference of ICOL happens is very active. We have our own meeting. We organize our own social event. We have mentorship round tables and we organize keynote presentations by the distinguished DEM engineers. Moreover, young professionals have a reduced fee to attend the conference. Also, if you send a paper and you have a presentation at the conference or you have a poster at the conference, there is a competition for the best poster and paper award happening at every conference. Uh, in between 
these yearly events, we stay active online, we organize webinars, we organize online meetings, and we also support a LinkedIn group, which has over 1000 members, where we post anything that we'll, we believe is interesting for the young professionals in the field. Now, the group is closed, you have to enroll in it, but once you're a member, you can also share there. So it's sort of a interactive platform. So if you're not included, yes, we recommend you to click, to click and to get included. Also, we have a YouTube channel where we post the webinars. All of the webinars are recorded, also this one today, and the recordings are available on the YouTube channel, so you can watch them later on. So I will conclude with this. This is a very short presentation. Here you have some QR codes so you can assess the web pages that I mentioned. And now is the time to continue with the Q&A session. So we had today four presentations and five presenters. Uh, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand and moderator will unmute you and give you the opportunity. In between, there are some questions in the chat. So to get us started, I will read the first question of the in the chat and in between, become courageous and ask more questions. And the first question was to Narhes. Uh, somebody is curious if the iData tool is freely available. Um, uh, is that we, we prepared the iData for analysis for the, this three job that I mentioned is ready and it's doing great, but uh, we are not going to release it yet because we are a bit perfectionist we want to make it perfect and we want to add lots of other options to it so uh, we have some ideas how we can make it better better and better uh, so uh, every time we're happy with the enough options it has we we can decide about how to release it okay thank you we are looking forward then to see it live. Uh, the next question is to Stefan. Which is the platform and which you in which you collected all the information coming from the site, and how do you link this to the BIM model? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the for the question. It's a, it's a key question for these kind of solutions. Um, the solution that uh, that I've shown is is based on a, on a SharePoint uh, SharePoint application, and uh, then we linked it with uh, different uh, software solutions. And this um, I don't want to make publicity for different uh, companies, but uh, actually there are uh, solutions that we that already incorporated certain interfaces in order to connect it with a centralized database. Okay, thank you. The next one is to Jonathan. So your workshop extensively covered the setup, execution, and validation of the CFD models, focusing primarily on hydraulic structures like Garrison and Spillway. However, it did not address the influence of environmental variables such as temperature, sediment transport, could you maybe discuss how these factors might impact the CFD results and if there would be any additional modeling techniques or adjustments needed to adopt? Yeah, thanks. That's a very interesting question. Um, indeed, yeah, it was just an overview of one specific project, but you can adapt your CFD model, let's say, well, first of all, for um, what like different <laughs> temperature, you would change your... Um, your, uh, you specify your water density and properties. And uh, by the way, there was also another question talking about fluids uh, that I answered in the chat. It's also possible to um, model non-Newtonian fluids uh, like uh, tailings dams. Uh, it's something we can model with the Urshel Boxley um, model to define uh, rheology. But um, yeah, going back to uh, this uh, question, um, it's, uh, yeah, so you start by doing a hydraulic simulation. This one was just purely hydraulic. 
but uh, to model like real life phenomenon, you can add um, additional physics. So you can model, you mentioned in your question, sediment transport, it's something we can uh, model. Um, you can add, let's say, um, uh, surface roughness. Let's say you have grass or uh, growth of stuff on the spillway. So that's something uh, you can also define in your model. Um, you can add things like air entrainment. Let's say you want to model bulking uh, or like air being entrained in the flow, so expanding. So yeah, the idea is usually to start with uh, simple, with the um, hydraulic simulation first, and then uh, flow 3D hydro, um, you can activate multi like different physics model to uh, uh, model some more complex uh, phenomena. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I also saw that you already replied the question regarding comparison with the uh, measurements in the laboratory. Can you ma maybe also comment to those of you who, did, who didn't read your question? Yeah, there was a question about um, what challenges do we have um, modeling or like comparing uh, with the Garrison Dam um, case study. Uh, in this case, uh, well, I would say, first of all, um, dams and spillway is the oldest application for a CFD in civil uh, engineering. Uh, so like there's maybe like uh, 40 years of usage uh, or like 30 years of usage. So um, upfront, like um, it's something that uh, the software is already um, preset for. And uh, the main challenge for this analysis was just the sheer number of uh, simulations we had to run for all these different uh, structures, all these different uh, conditions. So uh, using uh, an auto uh, automation tool was great for that. And also the nice thing is that you can either uh, model at the scaled down version, but you can also model the one-to-one -one, um, model like in the, the real life uh, dimension, which is not possible um, in the lab. So um, yeah, that's uh, one nice thing that you can, when you use a, a numerical lab instead of a physical lab that you get. Okay, thank you. And now uh, a question for Ettore. Now it's in Spanish, so I will do my best. But basically the question is, uh, if maybe you can tell first, how many instruments do you have at Itaipu and how often do you take measurements and something about data management from these instruments? Yeah, uh, I I read this, this, uh this questions in, in Spanish, so I could understand <laughs> yeah, how often do the instrument measurements take place? The readings occur weekly, fortnightly, monthly, quarterly, and semi-annually. And uh, the second question is, in the case of topography, uh, what closing precisions do you use for planimetry and altimetry? Uh, the closing precisions are five millimeters for planimetry and for altimetry is of first order with a tolerance of 0.5 times the root of K in millimeters. K is the length of the dam. In our case, is about eight kilometers. <laughs> May I continue with the other one? Yes, Cardo, Cardo continue. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the other is, do you have data on the loss of efficiency of the drains and or their recovery after cleaning? Are they effective? Uh, the answer is, uh, yes, we have data on the dip, on the depth of uh, depth me measurements of all drains before and after washing. And we are creating an index to create a priority ranking of the analysis, so we could focus on the the the, the worst one. Okay. And the the last one I received is uh, what is the method used to clean foundation drains? Uh, the answer is uh, we use water from the lake or water supply points available along the dam to move dirt from the bottom of the drains. Uh, we take care 
to prevent the pressure of from being so high that it could damage the drains. So uh, that's our the main the main procedure we use. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I will just add one question. How many people do you have involved in the maintenance of the dam? Precisely. Uh, we we ha we have a an a a, 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 a a company. Uh, we 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 contract uh, the external uh, mm -hmm. uh, company to make this maintenance, and they they have almost uh, fifteen twenty people working and uh, in cleaning, uh, making maintenance in in these instruments. Okay, thank you for now. Uh, now I oh, a question for Narhes. Uh, regarding the highest frequency, which frequency should be used to define the mesh for the numerical model? The frequency of the record of the earthquake that we are adding to our model, the highest one that we are applying. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And while I have you here, I will also ask you another thing. So if you maybe can comment. So sometimes in the numerical model, when we apply dynamic load at the bottom of the model, we can read the stress at the same element, but the read is not the same as we applied. Can you maybe comment on this? Um, I think uh, sometimes, yes, that happens. Uh, and that comes from the numerical error. And that that is that when you limit the foundation of a real foundation that is in infinite foundation and you make limit it into a, a specific pro a specific depth that's because you, you don't have a magic computer to calculate the infinite elements so when you make a model just a specific depth of the foundation if if this depth is not enough large so when you apply the dynamic load bottom of the foundation, these waves may comes up and again come back to the foundation. That shouldn't happen. So the thing that you are reading is not just the one that you are applying, but also the wave that came back again to that element. And that is that makes the problem. Thank you. And the next question will be, huh? Today, do we have any practical application of the CFD on dam breach analysis for tailing dams? So for John. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I presented uh, last fall at the Canadian Dam Association conference some work on uh, tailings dam failures. Uh, the challenge with tailings dams is to properly, uh, well, with tailings and non neutron fluid is to properly define the uh, rheological parameters of um, this type of uh, material. Um, but um, if uh, you are interested, just send me an email and I'll send you a link to this presentation. So basically we compared a numerical CFD model with um, actual physical experimental result from the um, USBR. Uh, they have this uh, debris flow flume. So it's, they do a mix of gravel and mud and they just open the gate and um, so we compared, um, we did the same setup, but numerically. Uh, so it was pretty interesting uh, for that. Okay, thank you. There are more questions for you. Does flow 3D hydro allow bi-directional interaction with deformable structure? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, uh, like we do um, two-way coupling or bi-dimensional interactions with floating objects or moving objects. Uh, deformable structures are a little bit more challenging because yeah, we need, and there was like another question um, related to, uh, it, can we model like deforming structures or like uh, how a wall will move due to hydraulic? So we don't do um, finite element uh, analysis. Um, we can provide information on forces and pressures on object. We can have floating objects or moving objects moving with that. 
Uh, but in the case of a rubber, um, I think it's a bit more advanced, but you can basically define a very high density viscous fluid as your rubber and um, model these types of interaction this way. But generally speaking, uh, we don't do finite element analysis, um, at least in flow 3D. So it needs to use other um, models to do that. Okay, thank you. Now, a question to Ruben Sancho. How can one qu quantify or estimate the movement, both horizontal and settlement, of a dam wall using drone survey georeference photographs? We can estimate uh, with different methods. Uh, it depends of our structure. Um, for example, if we have a very good uh, point cloud, we can compare both co point clouds. Or if we want uh, to make the comparison uh, sans a model, we can compare model to model, model to cloud. It depends on our structure. And then uh, we have several algorithms, and it depends on we have a flat uh, surface or, or with very different angles, it's better one algorithm or, or, or another. And uh, we have a point cloud, it's uh, all points are your reference, and all points uh, have uh, their coordinates then the algorithms uh, check the coordinates of one point in the first data collection and in the second data collection. And then we can, um, our result is the, the difference between, the, between these coordinates. Okay. Do you maybe have any experience with, let's say, insert data? Ruben, uh, can you repeat, please? If you have any experience with INSAR in uh, post-processing INSAR data, for example. No, uh, with only point cloud, with terrestrial and, and drones. Okay. No Thank you. Uh, a next question for Narhez. Can you suggest a freeware software for the convolution of time history acceleration input according to foundation configuration? Um, <laughs> let me think. I'm not the representative of any company here, <laughs> but uh, the the Berkeley University they have the lots of uh, different codes for doing different things, and normally they put it put them available accessible for open access. So if you search there, probably you can find them. And also some software gives you like a one month trial free. I think the thing that I remember, I think I, I'm not sure. I think that uh, Soils, I think has one month free uh, trial that uh, you can check because I don't have updated uh, information about that. Okay, thank you. And can you comment on how you treat the hydrodynamic influence? So reservoir dam interaction. Do you use fluid elements, interface elements? Um, the, I lost you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will repeat my question. I'm sorry. How do you treat hydrodynamic? No, no, I, I, I lost my window <laughs> here. Let you me... want to share with us something? No, just okay. Now I have you again. Sorry, can you ask me again? How do you treat hydrodynamic influence with the reservoir dam foundation? Do you use fluid elements or interface uh, elements? It's 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 quite it depends on the uh, on the computational cost that you want to accept, and also the software you are using, and also how important is that uh, that part for you so sometimes you just can uh, simulate it with the added mass of vista guards simply or sometimes you can just simulate a simple some simple elements and you add the far uh, conditions and near condition and contact condition that's like the thing that you can do in abacus i think 
and uh, yeah any element that you can that uh, they have the uh, degree of freedom of pressure because this thing that is important for the simulation of the hydrodynamic of the water is the uh, simulating that pressure so every element in in, in the manual the software you are using check it which elements support they have the degree of freedom of the pressure and use that element Thank you. Yeah, that's a lot dependent on the which software we are using. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Uh, question to Stefan. How long would it take to implement an AD system on a dam? Months, years? Um, <laughs> good question. Uh, it depends on the level of detail. I think in uh, in one year, you can get quite far, but don't do everything at once. Maybe you should choose uh, some uh, use cases, some processes you want to implement. And there you can start. I think you can have something going on uh, already in, in a year. And then I think the implementation is also important because it's not just uh, installing a program on your computer. You have to consider all the people that are working in your company that have to use it. Because if they, everybody has to work from one day to the other, all working processes, this will probably fail because uh, maybe they are not willing to it because it's also a lot of work. So do it progressively and maybe just uh, with the first milestone of one year to see what can you achieve, which is reasonable, and then go on. I think a whole process for a very complete integration takes more than a, uh, than a year. But uh, I think in... Uh, in a year or a bit less, you can start very well with it. Okay. I mean, I guess it also depends on the, how how big the group you have and what are your motivations, right? Yes, yes. And... Also the age, maybe. <laughs> the willingness to, to use new technologies, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, another question to you or to Ruben. What are the key considerations where researching and implementing a new decatalization management system for the dam safety management? And additionally, if you could provide any advice on integrating this new practice into new or into existing operations. Um, was not, you mean a management system to incorporate it? Yeah, I'm also not sure what the question exactly means, but, but... I think it goes a bit like in the direction I've already answered. Answered, yeah. I guess so, yeah. Yeah, so do you have any additional advice to it? Um, incorporate uh, the people that have to use it. Maybe not uh, start with, uh, let's say, incorporate your software team and also the engineers. But don't let everything do the engineers, but not everything do the um the it team so i think this is quite good to have a collaboration in the beginning and then when you implement it maybe with a project just uh, look for people that uh, are willing to do it and then they give uh, also transmit this motivation and to uh, to the people that maybe are for them it's more difficult to implement new procedures okay th thank you maybe I will add something and it's a little bit open. Maybe also somebody else can say something, but a lot of the attendees that listen to your presentations are young professionals. So can you maybe say some words? Are there opportunities for the young professionals in the field? Are there jobs available? Do you have any anything to say about that? Nobody wants to answer, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a general question for everyone. No way, but I can say like on my end that um, like computational fluid dynamic is a growing field. Um, it's part now of a lot of um, academic uh, curriculum. Um, as a matter of fact, for those uh, students or young professional, if you're still uh, related to um, a university, uh, we offer free licenses for um, academics. And um, yeah, it's uh, the the learning curve is not really steep um, when you have three D um, software experience and uh, a background in water. 
So I think it's a nice skill that you can add to your resume um, if you're interested, of course. Yes, I, I also want Mateja to encourage people to, to find part of the Young Professionals Forum. I think that it, on DAM engineering, we are living a very good time because DAMs are going to be critical in energy transition and and in, in the fight against climate change. So for young engineers to, to be introduced in this in this career and this profession of, of the, uh, by the Young uh, Professional Forum is, is a very good way. Uh, so I, I encourage them to do it. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, there are plenty of opportunities. I think we are lacking people, not not opportunities right now. Mm, okay, another question to John. The CFD model you have show, shown fits perfectly with lab, but do you trust CFD model without having a physical model to compare? Yeah, that was a pretty good question. So for certain application, I would say yes. Um, everything, if it's just hydraulic or water structure interactions, we know from experience that uh, it's like we get very good accuracy. Uh, there's been a lot of <clears throat> benchmarking and validation done through the years, like especially for dams and spillways. Uh, however, for other, so we like, as you've seen in my presentation for these type of application, we can be pretty confident with the decent resolution model to achieve less than 5% accuracy. But for other applications, let's say sediment transport or air entrainment, um, validation, like the model, the uncertainty can quickly go like maybe 20, 30%. So in these case, um, validations, like when you use advanced physics, uh, validation is uh, required. Um, I mentioned that uh, on our website, we have a, um, the Flow 3D Hydro uh, website, we have a section with the technical papers. So you can find a lot of validation or existing work that uh, have been done on different types of applications. So it's all listed uh, by different type of application and um, like people using uh, researchers or people using uh, the academic program, sometimes they publish paper, they did validation. So it's a good inspiration um, or it's a good source of information if you're uh, considering CFD for an application that goes um, like a little bit away from the beaten path. So I invite you to take a look. Thank you. Uh, well, well, I was studying, one of my professors said that all of the models lie, including physical, and basically, it is important to know the benefits of the model that we are using. And uh, as engineers know what we are doing, it's not just blindly to believe, but we have to do a good job. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, model is always wrong. It's just how wrong is it? 1%, 100%. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. The next question for Narhez. Can you suggest an open source software for frequency matching and scaling of time history inputs according to the target response spectra? Um, yes, the, the online website of Peer that uh, I mentioned in the presentation also, you it has a part that you can upload your target. You can now upload your design response spectrum, and again, according to that one, you can do the scaling. Yes. Can you maybe uh, copy the link to the website in the chat? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. And now there is another question, but I'm not sure for whom is it intended. But basically, the question is uh, if. Well, the author of the question is questioning, what are the solutions for uh, mitigate the spilling of reservoir with the sediment? Now, is it dredging or any other raising the dam? But I'm not sure who to ask to answer this. So if is any of the panelists volunteering to, to share some words on the topic? Yeah. Um, well, definitely, the, the, I mean, reservoir sedimentation is a challenge that we are all facing now, and 
probably the same solutions cannot apply e everywhere, but uh, we have a challenge ahead to sort this out, but maybe not this webinar is not the proper panel to ask this question. Uh, in if between, the question, I... if the question is about quantify the sediments, I don't know if that's the question. No. <laughs> but then, yeah. Um, otherwise, I think we answered all of the questions. Um, does anyone want to ask anything? Do it quickly now. Okay, then I will say thank you to all of the presenters. Uh, your presentations were very insightful. And now I would like to ask Alfredo Granados Garcia, the vice chair of European Club of High Cult, to close this session for today. Oh. Thank you, Mateja. Uh, first, uh, I would like to thank the co-organizers, Spankol and ICOL YPF, and also the speakers for addressing these uh, important topics. Uh, we had uh, excellent presentations and case studies uh, from which uh, I think we can learn a lot. And I would uh, also like to thank all the participants. I have been following and over 280 people and for the attendance and also for the contributions to have, to have a fruitful questions and answer season section. And well, also I would like to tell that uh, as a span call president, uh, Carlos Anel mentioned, this webinar is part of the European Dan Day and this initiative by the ICOL European Club following a, pro a proposal by ITCOL aims to communicate the benefits of DAMS. The, the European DAM Day will be namely celebrated tomorrow, the 29th of May. And so please check our LinkedIn profile for information that will be launched. And we will be using hashtags uh, DAM Day and DAM Day Europe. And we would appreciate your participation and help for disseminating the news. And uh, finally, on behalf of Spankol, uh, I would like to announce the Madrid candidacy to host the 29th cycle Congress in 2028. And uh, following this excellent organization of the webinar, I hope this to become a reality. And thank you very much and to all of you. Uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. So with this, we are concluding this session. Thank you to the speakers and to the presenters. Thank you to the presenters you. and attendants. Yeah. Thank you all of you, Matea, for organizing this. It was a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Thank bye you very bye, much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody.